Welcome to the Clifton Worley Show. This week we have Jonathan Turner. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, Clifton. Now, Jonathan, uh, we've we've known each other a little while. Um, we've met once or twice, and um, you uh, you live not too far from me, about an hour, hour and a half away. Over in, are you still in Hammond, Louisiana? Yeah, uh, technically in Pochettula, but it's like opposite corners of the interstate, so it's yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and um, so so the way I um, got connected with you, I remember um, doing a post. Uh, I don't know if it was Gear Talk Praise and Worship several years ago, or one of those groups, maybe Gear Talk. And um, found out that we were in the same general proximity to each other, and. We uh we started talking back and forth on the phone about uh songwriting, recording, playing music, worship, and um so so we've had several uh, interactions with each other and uh came over one day and hang hung out at my office and we were looking at some project that you had going on one day, uh with an amplifier that you had picked up. And uh Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, um, so I just wanted to, you know, introduce you to our listeners, kind of, kind of explain, um, how we know each other, but, um, Jonathan, if you would, if you would just tell me a little bit about how you got into music and, and kind of your story and we'll go from there. Absolutely. Well, um, let's see my story getting into music. It's kind of been a... I guess the best way to describe it would be like a a snowball that turns into, you know, avalanche. Um, Just because a lot of, of what I do, it just kind of really happened (laughs) and I don't really know how it happened, but it's happening and I'm loving it. And, um, but you know, I grew up uh, playing piano, uh, started doing that in second grade. And then around seventh grade, um, I really just got an interest in guitar and God really just kind of used that and continued to give me opportunities and doors that just kind of kept stepping through, um, even to the point where my sister married a professional bass player, um, which, you know, God's humor is just hilarious. Um, let me get to, to travel with them some after he got married. Uh, they needed, I used to travel for a guy named Joel Engel. He used to be a worship leader. And, um, First thing I traveled with them to was like 5,000 people, and it just like blew my mind. Um, and so, like, I just kept getting ridiculous opportunities like that, that uh, God just kept opening the doors up for me uh, to do. And it was really neat. Um, and so, fast forward several, several years, uh, and now I travel leading worship and to also play lead guitar for uh, people that need it. Um, when I'm kind of around, you know, uh, for me, the, the singer songwriter thing takes a little bit more preference to playing lead guitar, even though I do love playing lead guitar for people. Mm -hmm. Um, and I play lead guitar for myself when I travel just because I get really bored playing rhythm guitar and singing. Uh, and that's what I tell people all the time, but it's the truth. (laughs) It's the truth. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, around, you know, I think you've interviewed Brett before, Yes. Um, I just did their latest record. Uh, so I have a studio in my house and I, I recorded their latest album um, and did, I would say, a solid 70% of the guitars on it. Um, and let's see, I used to travel with a guy named John Mark Burge. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, and uh, he's a great guy. He got married and. Um, I think he's actually moving back to Mississippi soon. Um, him and his wife, and they're really cool people. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I used to travel. I mean, this was a long time ago with a band named Jens Unleashed. Um, way long ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're not even a band anymore. And pretty much what killed them was going to Nashville. Um, and if you're listening to Jens, I love you guys. Uh, <laughs> But, like, you know, they, they all kind of went their separate ways once they got to Nashville. Uh, but it kind of essentially the 
the weird random musical journey has started, I guess, when I um, kind of playing for a lot of different people was, I guess, in 2010, maybe. Um, I started just playing in kind of a local garage band near my house. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the name of our band was something stupid, like Seconds from Heaven or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was it was really cheesy. And <laughs> so we, we started traveling a l- little bit, but uh, the shows we kept getting were like not conducive to our style at all. Uh, it was like, you know, kind of a switchfoot type style playing with like Metallica type bands. Yeah. And so it was just really weird. Um, and I mean, I didn't really get kicked out, but me and the drummer were both kind of like drummed out, so to speak, mostly because they had a lot of grand visions that we just didn't share. Like, uh, you know, for one, they wanted to practice every day of the week Yeah. <laughs> and they wanted us to drop out of college, you know, like just kind of, you know, not really practical things. And I mean, on, on top of that, at this point, we had made zero dollars, you know, like right, right. going in zero dollars. And I mean, you know, for me, it's not necessarily about the money. Like God, God called me to travel and to do music, but and he provides. But at the same time, I got to I got to pay the rent. You know, like mm-hmm. there's there's that moment where you say, oh, like I, I have to keep the lights on this month somehow. Um, and God provides for that every time. So anyway, we kind of me and the drummer kind of vacated the band and uh, they went and eventually they imploded. That happens with a lot of local bands. They just eventually implode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, fast forward about six months and we had played a show with the Jones Unleashed and they were like, Hey, can you come do lead guitar for us for this thing? Cause our guy's out. And so that's kind of like the chain reaction that happens is you play with, you know, different bands and you get connected to another band and then something happens and you start to play for that new band. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I played for pretty Jones. common. Yeah. Yeah. I played for Jones for about a year and then uh, I graduated. Co- we all graduated college at the same time. We were all the same age and they were like, we want to go to Nashville. And I was like, you guys have fun. I'm staying here. Um mm-hmm. And so mostly just because I didn't really, I couldn't really catch their vision um, for moving to Nashville. And plus my girlfriend, now wife, was living here and I didn't want to move away either. And so, you know, I stayed here um, and I was on staff at a church. Uh, at this point, I probably would have been on there for about four years now, three years. And uh, let's see what happened then. I started traveling a lot more by myself. I uh, started leading for Fuge Camps. Um, I've been leading for them for a while, but that was my first summer. It was back in 12. And come on, Jonathan. Getting my head to work this early in the morning. Oh, yeah. And so then uh, after that first summer, uh, I connected with John Mark because John Mark used to be in Jones. Yes. And uh, so I started playing for John Mark. And... Uh, you know, I've played on off in him for him the last several years and recorded a couple of his records. Um, and I got connected up with Brett through the Jones Unleashed as well because I'm connected up with their pastor, Dean. Uh, and, okay. I mean, now we all go to the same church. Um, and so, like, it's just kind of like thing goes into another thing that goes into another thing with in terms of, like, me playing for people. Mm-hmm. Um Leading worship, it's kind of that way too, like traveling and stuff. But it's more like, um, it's kind of more like good old boy politics, you know. Like you got to know the right people, and you know when you befriend a youth pastor, they want to bring you in mm-hmm. to to lead worship for their their students. And, um, and I mean, it's more than that too, you know. It's it's just uh, for me, it's all about ministry. Like I get to minister to youth pastors and the students. Um, but that's kind of the essential breakdown of of traveling and, and leading worship and playing. Yeah, um, and we'll we'll get into some more. Uh, there's some other areas I'd like to touch that I that I uh, about recording and and your producing and stuff. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind of funny. 
all those guys that you just mentioned, except your local band that you were originally part of, like I've, I've crossed paths with, and um, I, uh, I live uh, in Poplarville, where Jones Unleashed was based out of originally. And then uh, John Mark Burge, he's a Pop- Poplarville guy. Actually, John Mark Burge, this is funny. He was like, I think in junior high when I was in college, and I was friends with his sister. She was our um, Baptist Student Union uh, like president at the time. Mm-hmm. And so, like, yeah, I, kn- I actually um, knew his sister, and then he was he was like this real young guy. And I'm a good bit older than, I guess, the Jones guys and, and John Mark, and I'm a little bit older than Brett. Brett's a little bit older than those guys. And uh, so, yeah, I'm kind of the old guy on the scene. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. Uh, Nothing wrong with that. No, no. I, uh, matter of fact, uh, Brett back when um, I was in my first band outside of like a church situation mm-hmm. we brought Brett in and that was like like his first band he was in and he was playing keys actually and uh, when I left that band he kind of took on I think he ended up like playing bass or guitar and, and he kind of um, started leading worship and having his own bands, uh, kind of fronting bands, uh, when I had left town. And so when I came back, like all these dudes are, you know, in bands and playing music and it's kind of, it's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, it was really good to see that. And, um, so it's been interesting to see, uh, follow you guys and all the different directions you're going. Um, I know like Jones Unleashed, um, the, the, one of the guys, he's a, uh, worship pastor down on the coast at a church now. Yeah, Kieran. Yeah, Kieran, and yeah. Um, doing some interesting things down there. So yeah, um, so you, I think I, I started talking to you about the time that you left Jones because I know they had mm-hmm. just moved to Nashville around that time, and yeah. uh, you, you. We're leading at a church, and I think you at some point in that you you made the decision to kind of go out on your own, and uh, you 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 did you were doing fuge camps during the summer, um, and then you you also started school down in New Orleans, <laughs> uh, yeah, and so uh, just really busy guy. I, I follow you on Facebook a lot, yeah. and uh, you're always always doing something. Uh, week to week. I know like, uh, during the summer, I really enjoy like all your recap videos that you throw up, uh, which you did that night. Um, you know, you'll be playing to a crowd of, um, teenagers and, uh, yeah. And it's really, really, looks like some really awesome stuff that you're a part of. Um, so, yeah. so what kind of happens in the fall? I, I know like all summer long, you about every week you're gone and you're out playing these camps and traveling and, uh, is are you are you do are you stay as busy during the fall? Um, last fall I was I was really busy. Like uh, and that was kind of you know a little bit more of our calling in the ministry. Um, we were we were traveling. I was at my church and traveling, but I've been at my church for eight years. Mm-hmm. And and last summer, so in twenty sixteen, God just kind of said it's time to to step out and have faith and go. And so that's what we did last August, and um, man, it's been busy. <laughs> mm-hmm. We've been um, everywhere since last August. It's, it feels like like we did a a D now that's a, a disciple now weekend up in Virginia, which was like a fifteen hour drive, and then we did another one down in Bradenton, Florida, which is another twelve hour drive. So mm-hmm. it's like those kind of things just kind of happen for us a lot. Typically, our, our fall is a little slower, and that's kind of the season I get to play for a few other guys around. Um, you know, usually in the fall, there's a, a record that I'm doing, um, and so there's usually a record that I'm producing. There's usually songs that I'm writing, um, 
you know, I teach private lessons during the week too, just to kind of make up the the difference in our budget. Mm-hmm. And um, I also like I got blessed with the opportunity to lead worship for students on Wednesday night at a church, um, which you know Wednesdays I hardly ever travel on, so it's just really it's still nice to be able to lead worship somewhere once a week. Um, but falls are typically a lot slower, and it's a lot different types of things like. Uh, fall retreats, winter retreats, back to school retreats. Um, compared to the spring, like the spring is always way busier for us, um, mm-hmm. and it feels like, you know, I, I mean, we we came back home around July, like mid July, and uh, we had like one more camp after Fuge that we did, and so I've been sleeping a lot the last few weeks, and it's been awesome, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. like I, I feel like I've been going since January, and. Uh, now, it's just are, been kind of nice to. Are you going to New go Orleans for school right now, or, or? I actually graduated last December. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. And I got. Yeah, no more school for me. That's uh, awesome. <laughs> I got. Yeah, I got an MA in apologetics, and you know that's just a really big word for defense of the faith. Um, and I think it's really something that goes well with leading worship, uh, having a really strong. Uh, theological foundation and uh, you know I mean I, I really believe like I think uh, musicians are given the stereotype of just kind of being dumb and uh, not studying very much you know I mean some days that's the case for me you know like I, I'd much rather be playing music sometimes than than reading but uh, no I really enjoyed getting my degree and um, it really helps me out a lot and just a lot of conversations and it helps me pick songs I'll play you know like it's just some songs I don't play because I don't agree with them theologically. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of weight on that in terms of, you know, in the scripture it talks about, like Jesus talks about, if you lead one of these little children astray, it's better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and run into the ocean. And so if if the songs we're singing, like these are, this is theology lessons. This is three-minute songs that people are going to be remembering, uh, three-minute sermons that people are going to be remembering. How much, how important is it for us to have correct doctrine and theology in that, um, and to not lead our churches, our congregations, or anybody that listens to our music astray? And mm-hmm. so that's kind of a lot of the motivation behind me getting an apologetics degree. I just want to be able to to handle the Word of God accurately, effectively, um, and to lead people where God wants them to go. Okay. Cool. Now, your wife was going to school with you as well down there. Uh, last mm-hmm. time we talked, is she is she finished up? She's still going. Uh, she's also yeah. She also graduated and she has the same degree. Um, currently she is one of the directors for a website called Women in Apologetics. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's going a lot of places. Um, I think they're about to have. It's kind of a newer website. Um, and the the management of it just changed recently to where they're they're taking the vision of it a little further than where it was. And so they're, they're actually planning their first conference in January in California. Um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be huge. They're going to love it. And so she deals a lot more with that kind of thing. Yeah. Now, is uh, she a musician? She is not. No. (laughs) Uh, and I, I'm, I, I think it's kind of a blessing in disguise, but I'm not sure. I mean, I dated two girls before I dated and married her, and they were both musicians, and the, but those relationships failed. So yeah. I think yeah. God has his hand in it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, yeah, I married a non-musician as well, and uh, I, I think it kind of um, centers me a little bit, you know, like instead of like just being all artsy and like following yeah. that. I mean, I, mean, I do, but um, it kind of keeps me a little grounded and uh, kind of centered back into the real world. Yeah, and I think that's something that's hard for musicians, too. You know, um, I think emotionally we we try to connect. And, I I mean, rightly so. Like, we communicate through music. And our emotions kind of get left on our our sleeve a lot in terms of just everything we do. And in that, we tend to find our identity in music, which, you know, it's it's not. Especially as Christians, like, as, as Christ followers, you know, our... Our identity is not found in anything that we do, but what Jesus has done for us. Um, 
And so that, that helps me kind of the same as you. It helps me stay grounded and, and know that like, Hey, like my identity is not tied up into the performance of me playing this guitar part, Mm -hmm. even though I want to nail it, you know, like I I want to, and I'm going to nail this guitar part. Like my identity is found in what Jesus did for me. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It also helps me beat that that stereotype of musicians that literally just play music all day. Um, Because I'm not that guy. Like, I compartmentalize my life a lot in terms of, you know, music. Like, I have time to do music, then I have time to chill and hang out with friends that isn't, you know, doesn't involve music, you know, and it just helps to, um, it helps to give your life breadth instead of just one focus that everything's wrapped up in. Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I want to talk about that a minute. Um, I know that I, f- I found myself in the past when all I did was focus on my music, like as my like career as a worship leader. Um, mm-hmm. I found myself down in the dumps a lot, you know, because like oh this expectation isn't getting met, uh, being made or you know I'm uh, frustrated because this isn't happening or whatever and I found that the more of like multifaceted that I allowed my life to be um, that uh, I was filling those other voids in my life you know and yeah. so and so like you can it's easy when you're a creative to find yourself um, stuck in ruts and stuff, and you don't know how to get out of them. But like, the the best thing may may be to network and interact with other people who aren't necessarily like in the same place you are in life. And yeah, that you know that's finding people who are a little bit further along the journey than you are, people who are completely outside of your field, who make you kind of question what you do. Mm-hmm. And it, or even being held accountable to somebody like that, but it, it you know you find yourself like I, I know a lot of um, worship musicians, like our worship leaders, who music has kind of become their job, and their hobbies are not uh, music related, and and it's 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 kind of like you wouldn't expect that, but like. I know, I've met some worship leaders who, like, if you want to talk shop or talk about gear and stuff, they kind of change the conversation. You know, it's like, oh, well, I enjoy f- fishing and hunting or, you know, I have, like, this uh, uh, stream sports or action thing kind of going on where, you know, that's what I'm into. And um, it's, it's just kind of interesting, like, uh, how multifaceted that world is and, like, all the different... Uh, you know, just because a guy can sing well and play well doesn't mean that he wants to talk about guitar pedals or amps or <laughs> yeah, know, that kind of thing. And so, and so it, it, it it's interesting. And then, like, uh, the kind of the world where I'm in right now is like everything's gear related. Like, a lot of my friends are, um, you know, really into gear. And, you know, they may not be professional musicians, but, like, even, like, a lot of our listeners, they're heavy, heavy into gear. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, which, actually, you are a pretty big gear guy from oh, talking yeah. to you. Oh, yeah. I love, I mean, like, I have, you know, it's, I, I love diversifying, but, man, I have zero hobbies. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just because, like, you know, um, well, for one, I don't have money to have a, expensive hobby you know yeah. uh but you know like I, I really just enjoy like i do i do play a lot i mean i i'm probably either leading worship or playing five days a week mm-hmm. and so when i'm at home i just really like to set all my stuff down just to to chill and do different things i mean one thing i'm kind of doing right now that's i guess it could be considered a hobby unless it really produces something is i'm trying to write a book <laughs> Okay. And like it's just, kind of, it's just kind of like a different fun thing that I I picked up. But I mean, I love playing video games. But yeah, no, I'm a huge, I'm a huge nerd uh, when it comes to gear. I mean, I love talking about gear. Um, and I'm not always the guy that's gonna change. Like, 
you know, I have some friends that literally, it's like the flavor of the week. Like, they just change, they have a different guitar and amp every week. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, my pedal board has looked the same for a while, you know, like in terms of, I mean, I might get one or two new pedals a year. And uh, my amp setup now, I think it's becoming very consistent. And, you yeah. know, guitars are pretty similar too, you know. Uh, I've been playing the same guitar for two years and I really like it a lot. Let's it's talk about my... let's talk about your gear for a minute, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, that guitar. Totally. What what's the guitar? Uh, it's a moniker. Is okay. What it's called. Yeah, and uh, I think I, I played that. You brought it over one day. Oh yeah, I mean I I love it. It's um, let's see, I'm kind of looking at it right now. It's it's kind of similar to a Duesenberg type style, mm-hmm. but actually the thing it's the closest to is if you look at the. Uh, Oh shoot! What are those amps? Um, man, it's gonna hit me in a second. Uh, ah, <laughs> what are what are those guitar amps? Um, the Thunder, the what's that JHS pedal? The Thunderbolt. Yeah, the Supro. Yeah, the the Supro guitars they mm-hmm. just put out. It it really looks like those guitars. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, I can, uh, I can see that. Yeah, which I think is really funny. Like, uh, I mean, they were made in the '60s, and then I got one two years ago, and then the Super o guitar came out like a year ago, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Wow, they like ripped off my guitar," you know? Like, um, but no, I mean the the company themselves, like Moniker, they just build custom guitars, and um, you know, you get to go on their website and design what you want, and they'll build it for you. They'll give you a good payment plan, and and uh, usually they say it takes about six weeks for them to build a guitar. That's not And bad. so, yeah, it's, it's not a bad turnaround at all. And they'll ship your guitar to you after two payments if it's ready, which is pretty cool. They'll do like four, four payments of no interest. So they gave me a pretty heavy discount. You know, they my guitar should be like 2500 and they, they gave it to me for 1400 Okay. Um, and it's... Uh, you know, it's a dual TV Jones, uh, Bigsby type of guitar, um, with maple neck. I just really, I like a bright sound, Mm -hmm. uh, because I do a lot of lead stuff and it just, it kind of nails it. Um, it definitely doesn't have any chunkiness to it at all though. (laughs) And that's, that's kind of what I found with it. You know, when I'm doing rhythm stuff, I need to change it to a different guitar, Mm -hmm. um, which right now, electric wise, I just have three main squeezes. I have that moniker guitar, which is like I play it all the time. Um, you know, at least ninety percent of the time on stage, and it just it sounds good. It sounds like a worship guitar. You know, it's really uh, bright and jangly. Mm-hmm. You know, so is the correct you know terms I use. Um, the other two guitars I have, I have a Mexican Tele that I put. Um, Kenman pickups in. And uh, Kenman, from what I've been told, I don't know how accurate this is, but this is what I've been told, is that those are the type of pickups Brad Paisley uses, is Kenman pickups. Okay. Uh, and, man, they they make this telly sound like a real telly. You know, like a, a real countrified telecaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, just one of just my favorite sound- tones. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of my favorite, too. Like, I don't. I don't want to own a telly that sounds like anything else other than a country guitar. Yeah. Um, because that's just iconic for it, you know. Um, and so I'm. I'm really big into having guitars that do their one job really well. Mm-hmm. You know. I mean, that's that's part. I don't own a Strat, and that's the reason why because Strats are so versatile. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I mean, they do the the John Mayer tone really well. Um, but with them being so versatile. I typically lend towards guitars that do one thing really well. Yeah. And so, you know, most worship guitarists in the last 10 years, they've owned, like, they either own or have owned a Tele. And then my Les Paul, which is a, it's a lawsuit era guitar. It's a Univox. And I bought it, you know, let's see, I bought it, I guess, back in 2009. And I didn't. I had no idea what it was. I, I just went to the guitar center one day. 
I saw this really gross looking guitar, you know, like the back plate was off of it. Mm-hmm. One of the pickups wasn't even working on it. Like you could tell, like it just wasn't soldered in mm-hmm. and it was listed for 250 and I just got my paycheck and I was like, sweet, I'll buy this. You know, it was kind of like that kind of thing. Like, you know, you just walk out with a guitar when you have a paycheck in your hand. <laughs> um, you know, col- college Jonathan, not necessarily now Jonathan. Right. You know, I said that <laughs> to my wife's chagrin. Um, but the, anyway, like, so this is, you know, it's it's basically a copy of a 72 Les Paul Custom. And by golly, if it doesn't sound just as good as one, uh, in my opinion, like it, it sounds phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a real, like, I had a 2001 Gibson Les Paul that I sold to keep this one. Wow. Uh, yeah. Just because, in, in my opinion, it'll beat out any Les Paul it's put up against. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I've done a few things to it. Like, the, the pickups that came in, I have no idea what they are. It's kind of one of those happy accidents that I don't want to fix. You know what I mean? Like, it sounds really good, and why screw it up with <laughs> yeah. the same for it? Um, yeah. But the pickup in it says Larave, which I'm like, what the heck? You yeah. know? Um, and I guess the bottom one might be some sort of Seymour Duncan type of thing, but... No, Univox, from what I've been told, is the the brand that created the lawsuit. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of brands, but Univox is probably one of the more popular ones. Um, and so that's kind of like my three guitars. I'm also I have a project that I'm working on that me and you were working on the other day. The um, it's like an ES335 copy of mm-hmm. Univox from mm-hmm. the '60s, and uh, I'll be excited to get that thing up and running. I'm I'm selling some stuff so I can work on it. And, uh, you know, I want to, I want to kind of trick it out and see if it, I mean, it sounds good now, but it's like fretted out you Now I got to get it refretted. Mm, yeah. Got to get new tuner heads and I got to get a big be put on it and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'll be fun. Like, but those are my, my three electrics and, uh, my acoustics I have, I have two lawsuit Takaminis from the seventies. And so typically for those, I just tune them down a whole step, and uh, I get I get like a <clears throat> Elixir Resonator Polywebs. Mm-hmm. And, and so those those strings, it's like the bottom two. I think the bottom gauge is like a sixteen. Um, so they're super thick, but they keep the tune down a whole step. You know, because if it's a if it's a lighter gauge, it's really hard to tune your B and your E strings with that. Mm-hmm. And especially, it's hard for you to get into playing, like, really just growl at your guitar, you know, with your strumming, mm-hmm. and for it to stay in tune with lighter strings. But uh, And that's something I kind of picked up from Phil Wickham. He does that with his guitars as he tunes them down a whole step. And um, it just yeah. kind of, because most of the time I play acoustic, it's not me playing acoustic for somebody. It's me playing acoustic by myself. Mm-hmm. Um. And so, I mean, if I was going to play for somebody, I'd probably figure out how to tune one up, you know, a whole step, and get it back into standard tuning. But I have two of those, and I have somewhere, I think I lent it to one of my guitar player friends, like a a jumbo Takamini that they just came out with like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, It was kind of like my first guitar, but it was a really good one. It's gotten a lot of age on it. It's gotten a lot darker. Yeah. Um, there was one of those, uh, lawsuit Takamis that came through the pawn shop here, uh, locally. And, uh, it looked like it, it got snatched up recently cause it's not there anymore. But those are, those are really cool, uh, guitars. Uh, they're unlike, like I spent several years playing, uh, I owned a couple Takaminis, like the G series. And these yeah. are you just different, different, um, uh, just a whole nother level, you know. They're a lot better guitars. The lawsuit yeah. are. I mean, I have a friend who has like the, you know, like the best tailor you can buy, like mm-hmm. the three four thousand. And he played mine. He was like, "I hate you," you know, like <laughs> three or four hundred bucks on these, and uh, you know, he spent ten times that. Um, and I mean, you know, I do have some dream guitars. Like, I'd love to own a Collings acoustic. Absolutely. Um, 
you know, that's kind of like a before I die guitar <laughs> on a guitar. Um, or when I'm famous or if I ever get famous, which probably won't ever happen, but callings, you know, I'm just like, please, I want one. <laughs> um, you know, I want to spend three grand on an acoustic. Well, I, you know, I've, I'm really spoiled on acoustics. I went through a phase where I tried every five to $600 guitar I could get my hands on, you know, just, I would buy one and then I wasn't happy with it. I'd sell it. And I kind of went, spent a couple years doing that kind of thing. And then um, I got my hands on a, a really good deal on a Taylor 714, and I haven't looked back. Oh, wow. Like, uh, I just, I'm so spoiled that now, like, if I play a, um, just an okay guitar, like, I find myself complaining, like, oh, man, you know, this just doesn't sit right. And, it, you know, when I when I play it with our band, and, and it's... What the thing I really like about that guitar, it like brought something out of me that I didn't have, because like when it right. when I finger picked, like it uh, it projected so well, because it's an odd, it's like a grand auditorium style guitar, you know, right? Like an oversized triple O, and yeah, it was uh, so articulate that I found myself like changing my playing a little bit to where now like I'm I'm playing um, a little more finger style and. And you know, emphasizing some melody lines while I'm playing, and stuff that like you could not get that articulation out of a guitar with laminate back and sides. And right. so, so I'm kind of spoiled there. <laughs> uh, and I was actually thinking the other day, this is me going off on a tangent, but <laughs> I was thinking the other day about um, I'm, I'm planning on going to DC in about seven weeks to the awaken uh-huh. the dawn thing. Uh and so I uh I was thinking, man, I really don't want to be toting my tailor around, you know, in the middle of the night, riding the metro down to the National Mall. I don't really want to have that. But then I got to thinking, for me to be happy with a guitar and not be frustrated, like I'm probably gonna have to be in the five to seven hundred dollar range, like right off the bat. And then I'm like, why am I gonna do that? You know, why am I going to spend that kind of money? (laughs) So I don't know. Um, But if I could run across a really good beater, you know, for a couple hundred bucks that sounded pretty good and fretted out good and, you know, projected uh, pretty good acoustically, um, I probably would snatch it up at this point. I think I saw recently on either New Orleans or Baton Rouge, like Craigslist, like another lawsuit. So jump on it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i'll have to go check those out i've got a friend who's telling me um and he this dude is like flipping every week a different guitar you know and he was telling me that he's kind of landed on breed love and yeah, you can, are really good too. yeah you can pick up their um like they've got a whole new lineup but you can pick up their previous lineup and i think like um they were made in korea we're now like the Newer ones are made like in China, uh-huh. but uh, you can pick up like their Passport series that has a pretty good solid top, and it's got I think uh, laminate back and sides, but it's got a really nice pickup in it. And you can pick those up for like yeah. the two hundred range right now, like used when they used to be like five hundred dollar guitars. And he said yeah. for that price, like that's about the best you're gonna find that has good electronics in it that plays well, that sounds pretty good. And so I kind of got my eye on that. But, um, yeah, Breedlove's great. Like, I really like the Breedlove's from like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, the newer ones I haven't been too enthused with. Yeah. Like, I just don't like the new logo. I like the old logo a little better. Okay. Um, you know, I think Shane and Shane used to play one. I really liked it. Uh, and I played a couple, like a couple from that era. Like I was hanging out with a guy named Jared Espy. He's a worship leader. Um, a couple of months ago, and I played his, and it was just, it was really nice. Like it felt great. Um, but you know, I mean, like I said, like I don't play acoustic enough for me to get a calling yet. You know, <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, like I said, I want to get, I want to get like a, I want to take a lot of money into one that I'll have for thirty years. 
Yeah. Um, one point, they used to have some builders near my house. Uh, oh, what was their name? Um, gosh, I'll remember it later. They used <laughs> to have some built some builders near my house that put out like a baseline thousand dollar guitar. Okay. And really, just before a lot of guys were getting into it, um, man, they were good. Like, uh, my dad was friends with him, so I went over to his house, and he let me play some of their guitars. Like, he's a certified Martin uh, repair guy. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, Martin certified him to repair any any Martin thing in in the South. And, uh, man, they were good. But, you know, I definitely lean a little bit more towards the bluegrass type of sounding guitars. Mm -hmm. Um, And, I mean, I love a good Martin, too. Like, yeah. You know, when you get above that two thousand dollar price point, one of Martin is just like glorious. But um, yeah, I mean that kind of that's my acoustics as far as like amps right now. Um, I have a Good Cell Super Seventeen that uh, I've had for the last three or four years. I've really liked it. Um, I played one when I was in high school, and I just fell in love with it. And it's always kind of been like my goal to get one, and I got one, and I just love it. Um, and it's, I mean, it's beautiful, and they're all built out of Atlanta by uh, Richard Goodsell, and uh, all handmade. I yeah. think at one point, Zeke Top played one, um, and some guys like that. But it's it's essentially, I mean, he builds them out of B3 organ tube parts. Yeah. And uh, I think, I want to say, uh, I've had friends tell me it's a very, and I, it. For me, too, it feels like a uh, an AC type of circuit, you know, um, but like a really high-end AC30, you know, not just like a a cheap one. Yeah. Um, and then a 112 frame, and uh, it's really cool, too, because it's, it's so small, and I can switch it down to 5 watts, which is really cool, too, but, you know, it's just, it's so easy to travel with, Um and I finally, I sold one, and then I just, I got one back literally last week, a, a deluxe reverb. Mm-hmm. I just love that amp. It's just something about it. Um, and I mean, I've heard a lot of studio guys, especially in Nashville. Like, if you get in Nashville, nobody's playing boutique stuff. They're all playing deluxe reverbs and Princeton's in the studio. Okay. Just because they sound great. That's It's literally um, the most recorded on two amps of all time yeah i could see for country players that that um kind of clean platform um yeah is is really good um yeah i've heard of good sell for a while and um i think uh this if i remember right the story on him was he he used to be like repair organs and stuff and he started like building amps out of those projects and then he kind of it kind of went from there um but but everything i've seen that he's done has has been really cool you know Um, oh it's super neat yeah which i i I almost uh i had i had a hammond m3 i had a couple of them actually and then i had a uh like a wurlitzer organ Uh and i could just not bring myself to gutting those out because they were functioning like organs. Yeah. Um, and, and I thought about, man, this would be a good, you know, donor amp to, uh, to make a, you know, I had like a head cab that was like a Marshall size and I'm like, it'd be perfect. Yeah. You know, pull the chassis out and just rewire this thing. And I could not bring myself to do it. So <laughs> my hat's off to a guy who can actually do that, you know? And, uh, Oh yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, lately I've been running, I'm, I'll talk about my pedal board in a second, but lately I've been running, uh, this summer I've tried to run, I had a Silvertone 1483, mm-hmm. and I really like it, it's just not really my flavor, so I'm actually, I'm selling it right now to fund the guitar repair, um, but it's really cool, it's a really great amp, I mean, people compare it to... A uh, a baseman. Okay. And uh, it just gets it's it's really hard for me to get 
a tone by itself. Like I, I want to have two amps that I could either run by themselves or together. And uh, the deluxe reverb, I mean, I did my whole last album on that one, mm-hmm. you know, and it just sounded great. Um, but typically I've been, instead of running stereo, I've run dual mono, which is a little different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll mic my good cell super bright, you know, get, get the tiniest tone I can. And then I'll mark, mic my uh, deluxe reverb a little darker. Mm-hmm. And then just have two channels on the house board to where they will turn one or the other up depending on what they need. Okay. Um, in terms of, you know, like they'll run both at the same time, but, you know, if both of them together just make a really good tone, I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, now, do you do like a dark. wet dry or, or both of them uh, process no. the same? Yeah, both of them are processed the same. Um, that would that would just freak me out too much. <laughs> uh, and I mean, even even with like you know ping pong delays, like that would also freak me out too much. And I mean, I, I paint them in my ears. You know, I have a stereo in ear system, and so I'll I'll pan the guitars, but uh, or pan the amps a little bit. But I just really like that concept of a dual mono, uh, especially because. And I mean, you know, live guys are welcome to argue with me all they want, but on the road, okay, like purely on the road, you never have a true stereo setting uh, mm-hmm. in terms of your live sound because they, they never run that. There's hardly anybody that stands in the middle of two speakers to get the stereo pan that you want to get in a studio. Now, like in a studio, I'll do it all day long, mm-hmm. um, but just, just not on the road because it's not a conducive thing uh, to do. But pedal-wise, um, let's see. I'm going to start from the beginning. And so I'm going from guitar to amp here. So I actually just picked up, this is one of my new buys, is a um, the new Keeley compressor. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember what it's called. It's the one, it's going to be 170, but yeah. right now they're on sale 130. Yeah. And... By golly, if it's not the best compressor I've played through my amp yet, you know, uh, I mean, it's probably the it's the fourth one I've been through, and I just love this one um, because I, I mean, I started with the Dynacomp, you know, every guitar player should, but the Dynacomp couldn't really work with humbucker guitars, and uh, even after I got the JHS Dynacomp, which is supposed to sound like a Ross compressor, yeah. yeah. And it also sounded incredible, especially through my telly. But, you know, it just wasn't what I wanted. And so the Steak and Eggs came out that's a JHS and Keeley combination. Mm-hmm. And I almost bought one, but I just held out hope knowing that they would make a compressor <laughs> that's just that one side of that thing. And so they made, let's see, JHS came out with one first. They made the uh, the pulp and fill version four, mm-hmm. and what I liked about it is it had a blend and a tone knob. Okay. And so, for me, that helped a lot more with my Les Paul type sounds, you know, my humbucker type sounds. Um, but you know, like the big butt is the the Keeley compressor came out just like a month and a half ago, and uh, oh, here's the name: the, the Keeley Compressor Plus. And it has a, a single coil humbucker switch. Okay. And man, it sounds good in humbuckers. Like, it just does everything you want a compressor to do to your humbuckers. Yeah. Uh, and so that's kind of been my new one. And it's so cheap. Mm, like, yeah. yeah. 130, you know, compared to if you get version four of the Pulp Appeal, it's 250. Mm hmm. Uh, compared to 130, I mean, it's just a no brainer for me but i have that one and i have that running into uh and i mean i have all this run through uh a looper that uh it's not like a you know digital looper that a lot of guys are going to i'm still a little too analog for that i can't get my mind to to want to do that Mm -hmm. um but so i have a a boost called um, the mk423 Okay. From the Creation Audio Labs. And okay. man, it's good. It's kind of like a, I keep 
my compressor and my boost always will lend to just get to my amp a little harder. Yeah. And just kind of get to that point of breakup a little quicker. And so I have those running into my volume pedal. I'm, I'm that guy. I'm a volume before drives guy. Okay. Uh, just because I think practically of leading worship that I don't want to reach down and turn my volume knob down. I want to do it on my pedal board. And so it's just way easier for me to do that to where, you know, I can have my volume at half and a drive on it and it'd be clean and then ramp it up to drive when the song gets up. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's a lot more feasible for me. Um, and, you know, I just have, let's see, out of the boost, I go into a, uh, I just got the Dunlap volume pedal. Okay. Because I had it with my Ernie Ball. <laughs> yeah. I broke another string. You and, have the uh, full-size Dunlop? It's the middle one. Okay. Whatever the middle one. So it's not, it's, it's literally the same size as the, uh, the Ernie Ball. Okay. Um, I have a friend who has the mini one, though, and he really likes it. But, you know, I wear size 12 shoes, so it's <laughs> not too big. Um, yeah. But anyway, out of that, I have four drives right now, and one of them is unplugged, and I'm about to switch some out soon. But uh, I'm about to do, my pedal board just looks like a studio pedal board. It doesn't look like a, a touring pedal board, you know, like uh, it's just messy. Um, but I actually have the Ross drive, um, okay. from the seventies mm -hmm. and it's a really cool pedal. It's really synthy. Like I could do some really cool stuff with it. Um, and it gets so dirty. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I have that. And I'm not a big fan of stacking drives. I, that's just, I would rather have a good preamp section in terms of a, a good compressor and a boost mm -hmm. going into one. That's interesting. Drives. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, it just makes more logical sense to me to do that. You know, I want to buy a drive that does it all, and I don't want to have to combine it with another drive. Um, so I that. I have the Timmy, which I love. Mm -hmm. I think it's... It's a I popular it, worship, like, yeah, worship pedal. Yeah, like every, every worship guy should have one of those because it just sounds like a worship guitar overdrive. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, I have... Well, not lastly. I have a uh, a full tone OCD version one. Hmm, me too. But, uh, it's not plugged. In right now. Yeah, it's not plugged in right now. Uh, I'm probably gonna trade it out with uh, either the Ross or the Timmy. Okay. Um, but what I've actually been playing a lot more of recently is just kind of like my drive is the uh, the Soul Food JHS mod. Okay. And man, I mean it's it's ridiculous. Uh, if you watch their video of them switching it between like their, you know, $2,500 Klon and that, you cannot tell the difference. And, you know, if you can, more power to you, but I, I haven't been able to tell the difference. Right, right. Um, and it just sounds so good. Uh, and so that's that's kind of like my drive section. Um, and as far as like, you know, the delay and reverb goes, I have... And I, it's really cool. So I had two DD5s mm -hmm. that I kind of contacted JHS about rehousing. I was like, hey, like, could you guys, you know, what would you guys charge me to rehouse and to do all the mods you do on these DD, DD5s? And so they said, if you send us your pedals, we'll rehouse it and do all the mods for 250 bucks. Okay. Which is yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. Because, you can go out and you buy, know, like, um, you know, any kind of big delay pedal. You're going to spend at least um, that much. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, in each of the, in the end, it came up costing close to 450 because, you know, each boss is like 500 or 100 bucks. Um, but what I had them do, you know, they do the dual preset mod and they do the analog digital mod. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what they built me is one pedal that has two DD5s in it. And like a section for each DD5 on each side mm -hmm. that has switch on each side of the pedal. So each pedal acts independently from each other, but it's in one house. And uh, essentially it'll just change the setting from one of their two settings. Mm -hmm. And I can even have, you know, I have the right side on digital and the left side on analog. So I'm a big, uh, I'm a big dual delay guy. But I'm a big dual delay guy in series and not in parallel. Um, 
And I, I've had pe- pedals that do parallel, but I'm just not a fan of that sound. I want it to sound like one pedal is going into another pedal. And so that's what this pedal gets across to me is um, that sound. And I mean, it just sounds really good. You know, like Boss DD5s are just legendary. And, you know, imagine having two of them and one of them has an analog chip in it. Yeah, that's, and, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and all my delays too. Like I have that. And after that, I have the, like the JHV3 M9. And so like it has all the mods on it pretty much. Like the soft switches, uh, the sound upgrade, the tap tempo input. But I have a, a pedal called the Time Traveler by Tapestry Audio. Mm-hmm. And what they do is they send out TRS tap t- tempo signals based mm-hmm. on a BPM. So it has, you know, 10 presets of a BPM clock that I'll send out to all your pedals that do delay, time mm-hmm. delay. Mm-hmm. So I have it going into my 2DD5 and then into the line 6 pedal. And, um, and I'll get why that's important in a second. But I have the M9, and it's kind of like my Swiss Army knife. Uh, I used to run my delays off of it, but now it kind of does a little bit more. I do like an auto volume synth with it. Mm-hmm. And so it's just, I'll swell into that. And I have a, there, I have their auto volume preset with almost infinite repeats to where, you know, I'll just swell in one chord and it'll be kind of like a synth for a song. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really helps when I'm playing for people, mm-hmm. uh, especially people that use backtracks helps a lot and uh but lastly the the verb i use I actually have the rb6 but it's the jhs modded one with the dual mods so i have just like a normal verb and then like their mod verb which is kind of what i leave on all the time anyway but uh you know i'm not a big fan of like switching around a lot of songs for my stuff uh i typically keep the sound of um my preamp section the uh the the soul food that's what it is the two dd fives and then the uh, that boss reverb and when I need other sounds I'll go to it but that's not a typical go to yeah you know yeah. for work that's an inter- that's an interesting perspective into your into your playing and how you approach it yeah I mean I just I really want my playing to kind of be the center of it you know like pedals they're great. And like you buy them and you get your sound and that's it. But your playing is going to take you a lot further than just having a lot of pedals. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's a lot of my, my thoughts into it, you know, is I want my playing to be the center point and not the, you know, not the um, thing that keeps me from going places. Um, and plus, you know, I play too, and this is why the time clock's important. I, all my stuff live is tracked. And so, you know, I mean, that's what every worship leader really is doing now is, is back tracks because you can literally buy them from the artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's so cool. Uh, I've, I've kind of grew up in the generation of back trackers that, that make their own. Right. And so I typically will build my own back tracks in my studio and the key I want them in. And, uh, you know, like the difference for me is like, I subdivide my click a lot more than most records do. So, like, I'll do I'll do eighth notes, mm-hmm. and I will vary the the beat, like the sound of them, so that you can hear where the one is. Yeah, and you can really hear where the subdivisions are. And I won't put a cue in mine because that's just really distracting for me when I'm trying to lead worship. Gotcha. Um, okay. And so, and plus, you know, like. What I do on the road, it's, it's a lot more artist and who pays the band kind of thing. Instead of it being like a band thing, it's more artist who pays the band. So, you know, I'm paying these guys a lot of money to know their stuff without a cue. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's part of it too. Um, but that's what that, that uh, tempo pedal helps with is that I don't have to tap in a new pedal, tempo every time. Like, I can just know what the set list is, hit the next BPM in. Yeah, press one button and I'm ready for the next song. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. so let's segue into, and this kind of be the last part of our segment, but uh, you do a good bit of recording. You've been producing albums 
uh, working on other projects. Um, you know, we've had a lot of discussion in the past about what you do there. And I guess for the next few minutes, uh, just kind of uh, describe, you know, what your process is there and what you're doing and kind of kind of where you're wanting to go. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, in the music stuff, recording's actually been more of my hobby, mm -hmm. uh, which is really mm -hmm. funny because a lot of people, they like what I do, and that's good. I'd rather be on the road playing. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I really just like helping people get their best sound. Mm -hmm. And so as a producer, what I want to do is I want to hear your stuff. Um, I want to kind of give you some really unfiltered, constructive criticism uh, about about songs. And so we'll work songs down, you know. And that happens a lot with some people. Like some people... I'm a big fan of keeping a song under 3.30, you know, like in time-wise. So that, that producer hat comes on and says, okay, how can we pull a song under 3 minutes and 30 seconds? Um, because, and there's a logic behind it, because people want to hear song. they want to be able to repeat that song. Mm -hmm. You know, you want people to say, ooh, I want to hear it again. But if it's like 10 minutes long, nobody's going to want to play that song again. Um, you know, unless you're just, Unless really it's oceans, weird. right? <laughs> yeah, unless it's oceans. Good lord, it's like a six-minute song. <laughs> it's like eight-minute song. Or you know, like I mean, there's just some songs out there that are like twenty minutes long. And you're just like, uh, get on with it. You know, like the uh, was it Monty Python where he's like, get on with it. <laughs> um, that's kind of what I feel like sometimes. But it says on the producer side, like that hat comes out and just says, hey, like. Let's, let's arrange the song in a way that people are going to want to repeat it, that uh, it's going to be condensed, it's going to get your point across. Um, and then, you know, the other hat of, you know, a song arrangement comes on and say, hey, let's do this, let's do that. Um, and I want to try to work a lot with the artist and give him what he wants in terms of that. Um, and I think probably the hardest aspect of working with all that Mm -hmm. is, is sometimes you work with people that haven't used a click tracker, you know, I mentioned that before, and it's just like, uh, yeah. you know, play in time. Um, and that, that takes a lot more editing work. But, you know, and for me, I'm, I'm not in any kind of illusion. Like, I know what my studio is good at in terms of I don't necessarily have all the bells and whistles that every studio has. Um, that's just not my particular studio. My studio is a really heavy, hey, let's get the right sounds, and I'm going to edit it a lot. And, you know, let's get your product out there in terms of just working. And, you know, there's a lot of good studios out there that have half a million dollar studios, mm -hmm. and they don't put any time into it. I mean, zero time. And that thing sounds like poop. Mm -hmm. You know, like... I've had some friends spend five thousand dollars on a on a record, and it sounded terrible. Mm -hmm. Like it sounded like garbage. I mean, even other friends that have worked with Grammy guys, like you know, guys that have won Grammy awards, and their record doesn't sound as good as when it's edited. And so, like my process, I, I work a lot with. You know, I get the, the scratch down. And typically with an artist, it's a lot more, I'll get guys that are local to come play that I know that are good. Mm -hmm. um, and when it's a band, we'll work with the whole band to get them in in time. And, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll edit through and we'll get through and we'll take the time to do it right. Um, you know, and I mean, it's even little stuff like edit the drums before the bass player comes in. You know, like, that's important. Like, time, make, quantize the drums before the bass player comes in to do his part. You know, because that's going to be a lot less work for you in the end. Because okay. you'll have to now, you know, and so it's stuff like that where, you know, editing the time, you know. And it's also not living under illusions, you know, I think for a lot of producers, especially new ones, like, there's just those guys out there that are like, I want it to sound raw and organic. Now, well, that's fine, but you realize every producer that makes money and every song that's on the radio is time edited, is 
uh, pitch corrected in every sense of the word. And it's mastered really well. And so, you know, for me, that's that's just what I try to do. Is I try to to not live under the, the illusion of, I want my thing to sound different. I was like, no, I want my things to sound like the things on the radio. And that's what I try to go for. Interesting. Okay. Is, I mean, like, it, it really is just, it follows the logic. Like, hey, they're making money doing that, and they're doing it right. So what can I do that's like them? Okay. You know. But, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of a lot of it. You know, I mean, in terms of what I have, like I said, it's not much. Like, I have, you know, a studio live. I have a few preamps. I have a few good mics and good studio monitors, and I use Logic 9. And, uh, you know, Omnisphere and uh, Melodyne, which mm-hmm. is probably the best single piece of, of like, gear you can just get. Yeah, I've heard that one uh, come up a lot, yeah. It's just good. Like, you can use it on anything. Um, like, I've used it, I use it mostly on vocals, but I've used it on violins, I've used it on trumpets, um, you know, you can, on bass, like, you use it on bass or guitars. I've never been good at using it on guitars, but that's just because I'm a guitarist, I think, and it's harder for me to edit myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, that's, it's such a good tool. So I know you, you've talked about, I heard you mention this. Um, uh, are, you, are you gearing yourself up to, um, to, you know, to make like one of those big moves to Nashville or like Atlanta or something like that? Um, we'll see. We'll see what doors open up. We'd love to. I mean, it, it's kind of coming at a point where I've exhausted everything I can here. Mm-hmm. You know, and we're making a living here, but it's it could be a much better living in Nashville um, or Atlanta. And I mean, Atlanta is is a cool move too. But our, one thing I'd love to do is be able to songwrite with people, and mm-hmm. so Nashville just kind of seems to be where all the songwriters hang out. Yeah. You know, no matter what genre you are, it kind of is where they all are. Yeah. I know a lot of a lot of guys. It's kind of where's the best scene, and it's up for debate. Yeah. Um, you know, just a couple of years ago, it was like Austin was the place to be again, and then um, I'm not so sure if people aren't cycling back to Nashville now. Yeah, well, I mean, Austin is really cool, and I've yeah. thought about Austin. Mm-hmm. You know, several times I have family over there, and that'd be a lot of fun. But here, here's the thing for me is that I got to think about where I'm playing at a lot during the year mm-hmm. and it's nowhere near Austin. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, like, everything I've played is east of the Mississippi. Yeah. And, uh, staying closer, you know, Mississippi to Florida to Virginia, um, to Georgia and Alabama, like those for me are going to be better than going to Austin. Yeah. You know. Well, if you move to Texas, you better be prepared to drive all the time to all, you know to play if you're going to be touring. For real, I mean Texas, you know it's cool. Like it's, it's a great place. Yeah. I love the tacos. <laughs> um, and I mean, in terms of a place to live, like I'd love to live in Austin. Um, in Nashville, it's just it's. You know, I mean, I haven't been in a few years. I'm actually going next month again. Uh, but. Nashville has just kind of got everything up there, too. But that's part of me. I mean, I grew up in Baton Rouge. Like, I'm kind of a city boy, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, we had a chance recently to move somewhere where the population was, like, 6,000 people. And I was just like, nope. <laughs> like, the town was teeny. And, uh, I mean, the nearest movie theater was, like, an hour and a half away. Oh, wow. And I was just like, ugh. Yeah. can't do that to myself. Um I like I like things to be fifteen minutes away. Yeah. You know. And I mean I drive all the time for work, but you know, fifteen minutes or less is kinda where I want all my necessities at, you know. Yeah. Let's talk about our region for a minute. Um and, and we'll have to close out here in a minute because we're we're sitting right here at the hour marker, just a little past. But um you know, we're kind of in this both of us in this proximity north uh, north of New Orleans, you're, you're on the yeah. west side of it. I'm kind of on the northeast. Um, 
what do you think? Because there is a there is a music scene there, but it doesn't seem to when it comes to you know the kind of music both of us are doing. That uh, the definitely the worship genre is not big there. Um, it, it's kind of a city that's dated in the past. Um, very yeah. the scene is very traditional. Um, do you think? Do you think there's room for guys like you and me in that in in this in the New Orleans scene? Uh, I think it's totally getting that way. Um, and it just depends. I mean, the New Orleans scene you know, that's more Brett. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I agree. I'm not. You know, like that's just not really me. You know, mm-hmm. like uh, I'm not that artsy. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I could be. I wish I could be. Um, in New Orleans scene, in terms of you mean like worship music or just like the the scene in general? Well, just yeah, both. We'll just say make a generalization. Uh, with the roots and jazz, it keeps me from from it, mm-hmm. and I think that's going to be for a while. You know, like me and you, kind of a little bit more rockers. Mm-hmm. Like Atlanta, a lot more our style. Yeah. Um. And, I mean, I find that every time I go to Atlanta, I have a, my brother-in-law and sister's church is up there. And every time I'm up there leading worship, all the musicians, like, they fit my style perfect mm. because they like rock, you know. And then when I find musicians that are more local here, it's always a lot harder. Just yeah. because, you know, that that's the whole nature of New Orleans is, like, we want to be different, you know. They're the most different place in America, in my opinion. And, yeah. um, it's like the you know, most uh, the, European city in the U.S., I've heard people say. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, you know, but in terms of music, like, everybody just does not like the popular. Yeah. Uh, which is weird for me, because I, I really, like, I think top ten, like, that's, that's where my heart is. But... Uh, and, and that's the hardest thing. Like, I mean, I think of a friend of mine that moved to a church down there as a worship pastor. He wanted to introduce them to Click Track. You know, just mention him. And he, they darn near had a revolt <laughs> uh, because they all felt insulted as jazz musicians mm-hmm. uh, to think that we need to have a Click Track, which, like, isn't the case at all. I mean, if you know anything about major touring, like, you're not you don't make money if you don't play the click track. Mm-hmm. kind of what it to. And, you know, it's just kind of funny the differences of opinion people have. Yeah. Um, you know, New Orleans, they want it very organic and everything. You know, and I mean, I even think about like Mute Math, you know, a lot of the sounds they make live are not pre-recorded. You know, now they play the click track and I mean, their roots are in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And they play the click track, but all, all the stuff they, all the electronic stuff they do, is all of them there on the spot. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the style that New Orleans has. And I think Mute Map is probably the best example of of what it could be in terms of just breaking out. Yeah, but even they had to leave, you know, and, and yeah. to to and, because the to yeah. you kind of get stuck in a rut in that scene, even though. Like when I I remember going to some early early Mute Math shows, and um, they were very avant garde, you know, just way out there for its time to me. Right. You know? And um, I think they had to get a little bit like when they made that move outside of New Orleans, um, it kind of it set them up to be better because if you stay in the New Orleans scene, like. You kind of have to play up to that to to draw a yeah. crowd. And I mean, you know, to be honest, like the way the New Orleans scene is set up, it's not set up for big shows. Mm-mm. Yeah. You know, it's all very on the street corner, all very uh, mom and pop bar. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that, the biggest venue there has big people come in, like you know, John Mayer was there last week. It's Smoothie King. The, yeah, yeah. Three Kings Center. I mean, I saw Coldplay there in '09, and it was incredible. Uh, you know, my my wife has seen like Beyonce, and uh, I think she's seen Beyonce, Lady Gaga, and Katy Perry all out of the 
out of the Pelican Dome or no, I think Beyonce was in the arena, like the actual Saints mm-hmm. stadium. Mm-hmm. But you know, like we have big acts come in, but we don't really have any big acts being generated from here. Yeah, I think the closest um, thing to that may be the Revivalist right now, and maybe Galactic. Yeah, yeah, revivalists have, have been a thing recently. Um, and I think that'll always be kind of the heartbeat. Now, I, I will say in terms of worship music, you know, guys that are, you know, I mean, I, I mean guys that are playing like click and track um, and kind of coming on board of everything else that other churches are doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the big churches in New Orleans that are that are reaching a younger generation are doing it. So like Celebration Church and Church of the King, they're all about click and track. Yeah. You know. And I mean I play the Church of the King a considerable amount. Like they they definitely, you know, their production is as high as you can get it. Um in a in a good way, you know, not necessarily like in a detracting from what God can do kind of way. Mm-hmm. But everything they do really just points to Jesus and their production. Um and so like but again, you know, Church of the King started in Mandeville and came to the South Shore, so yeah. it's not like a a homo generated type of thing, you know, like yeah. a home generated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, I mean, that's that's kind of it. I mean, you know, I've, I've always known I've never really fit in around here in terms of my style, um, and I mean, that's why I drive a lot, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. I've kind of uh, I went to California this summer. And I absolutely loved it out there. Yeah, um, you went to Nam, didn't you? Well, no, um, I went to Nam in Nashville this summer. I went out to uh, you know, went out a month before that out to North California, and I really dug it. And I, and it made me aware that man, there's so much more out there than you know. I love the South, but there's so much more out yeah. there, and the. Uh, seemed to kind of fit in a little bit um, with, you know, the guys that I met. Of course, they were all about, you know, my age, you know, in 30s and whatever, and had a lot of same musical interest. Um, But, um, you know, it's interesting all over the country there are music centers um, where people are gravitating to, and there's just something a little bit different in each one. I know I, I walked away from Nashville this last time, I loved my visit there, but for the first time ever, like I wasn't um, envious of anybody living there. Like I think I've kind of passed that cycle. Like I was kind of like, I don't know, this is a fun place to visit, but I don't know if I would live here. Yeah. And and it's interesting, but maybe it's because I'm kind of just settling in, you know, uh, into my life where I'm at. But um, I definitely like to visit, but I, I felt like the hustle and bustle of where it was, like I wouldn't want to live downtown or like if I lived there, I'd have yeah. to probably commute in and I just, I kind of like being near a big city, but not like right there all the time, you know, it's just too there. exhausting for me. And I mean, like, it's kind of the same, like, you know, me and Jade kind of live a little bit out in the middle of nowhere and I would totally... I mean, if I could if I could live here and get the same contacts here that I would get in Nashville, I wouldn't move at all. Yeah. Um, but like that that's just the realization for me is like if I want to do what I'm gonna do and have longevity with it, I need to I need to be where it's happening. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Um, now with that being said, like God's got to open up the right doors. You know. Um, I mean, me and Jade won't be able to move there without a job lined up mm-hmm. of some sort. And so that'll have to be kind of a thing, you know, like figuring that out. But, you know, God's going to do what he wants. So. Yeah. You just never know where you might end up. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, man, we've covered a just a very wide range of topics, you know, from just how you got into music to uh, we talked about gear for a while, and I love that conversation and talked about your your approach to recording and then kind of what you're looking for in the future. Um, it's been really interesting stuff, man. And um, I, I, I definitely wish you well. Um, I know that uh, 
you will uh, go on to do just awesome great things and uh, you've got a lot got a lot of talent and uh, I admire that Thanks, yeah I appreciate it I really do Really. Thanks so much for having me, man. Yeah, man, it's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll we'll chat some other time, man. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, you have a good one. You too, bro. All right. Bye. Bye, man.